Welcome. It's the FIH Hockey Pro League show. And today I'm joined by two uh, two gurus of the game, I think it's fair to say. Uh, Simon Mason, former GB and England goalkeeper and now uh, renowned commentator on the game. And Shay McAleese, um, former Black Sticks hockey player, Olympian and now assistant coach to the Black Sticks women's team. So uh, good morning or good evening. Good morning, Simon. Morning. And good evening, Shay. How's it going? Thank you for having me. All good, all good to see you. So, Shay, if we start with you, because um, it's pretty exciting times for uh, New Zealand right now, isn't it? Because I think it's your uh, your first foray back into international international matches since the Tokyo Olympics. Yeah, yeah, it's it's been a long time, uh, long time coming. Yeah, so the girls, obviously, with COVID and how we've handled it as a country in New Zealand um, and Australia, um, we haven't been involved with the Pro League, so it's been a long time coming since we played international hockey. Uh, and today's been very cool with the girls, you know, sort of getting into that day of um, pre-match uh, test match. And there's been a real cool buzz around the around the hotel. Um, so we're looking forward to the girls getting out for a good crack at, at Australia tomorrow. And um, we've got five new debutants playing um, tomorrow as well, which would be really cool for them to wear the black shirt for the first time. Yeah, and it's not just uh, debutants on the playing field, is it? Uh, I think the, uh, the coaching team's got a whole new look. And I think we're about to get some breaking news from you about uh, the new head coach of the uh, Black Sticks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, but um, kind of a funny one for me personally, probably, I guess, with uh, um, Darren Smith has been recently named, or well, basically as of today, as interim um, head coach of the New Zealand women's team. So if you look back to Tokyo, he was my my head coach, and now I'm coaching alongside him. So it's um, actually really cool to, to see him on the on the other side of the fence um, and, and work alongside him in the coaching aspect. And he puts a lot of hard work and, and diligence into what he does. And I'm looking forward to seeing his impact that he can put forward for the New Zealand women's team and hopefully it um, bodes well for us leading into a big year um, with the World Cup and Con Games back to back. Yeah, big, big year. I mean, how, how have the preps gone? Are, are the girls looking sharp? And, uh, and and also, I mean, it must have been challenging for you guys to sort of keep people focused and motivated. So there's been a lot of video analysis and stuff like that going on as well. Yeah, it's um, to be honest, it is it is quite difficult because you don't have like international hockey when you're playing a game. You, you get measuring sticks the whole time, so you actually understand you know where you're going and if you win or lose, you know where, where you've got to work on. And and as much as you can do in training, it's, it's, it has been pretty difficult. So we've been trying to um, we've been playing a few boys teams, so under 18 boys teams, just to ramp up the the speed. Um, we played a game the other day where where the opposition had 12 um, field field players on the pitch just to add a bit more of a, a tougher environment for our girls just to try and mimic, um, you know, what international hockey can be like. Because if you haven't played it, and it has been a long time as well since Tokyo, it's really hard to replicate. Um, so we've been doing our best to try and um, fill the gaps and then hopefully we've done enough that the girls just feel good and, and can play with a bit of freedom tomorrow. And I'm, I'm sure we'll get a bit of a measuring stick for the follow-up uh, three tests we've got after tomorrow night. Yeah. I mean, Simon, you've obviously been watching all of the hockey that's been going on in the in the last few months between Tokyo and now. Do you foresee Australia and New Zealand having problems when they come back onto the international scene in terms of getting back up to the speed of what's what's been progressing? I don't know either side in depth, because obviously I've not seen them for, for a long period of time. So to, to comment on the, the teams specifically is would be would be wrong, so I'd be guessing, but the, the principle is What's important is that the teams will have been trying to develop over time. They'll have played what they can. They'll have, as the show says, they'll have done with the matches that they can do. But there is no, as both him and I know from years gone past, there is no substitute for the whistle blowing for the very first 30 seconds of a game in any environment. It doesn't matter if you've been playing two years ago or two weeks ago. There's still a, a mental and physical intensity that comes. You can do as much running as you like, but the first 30 seconds, you always feel like you're looking for a new set of lungs. Um, and therefore you're trying to create that environment as much as you possibly can. So I think the test will be for, for players maybe who've been out for a little while. I wouldn't worry about the de- I wouldn't worry about the debutants because you've always got that emotional energy about coming into the sides anyway. So the challenge for me will just be a mental one. At the, last week with the German side in Valentin Altenberg talked about the fact that they hadn't played together for five or six weeks. And he was a bit concerned about them coming into the game off the back of that. These guys haven't played together for years. Oh, sorry, played internationally <laughs> essentially for years. So uh, there will be challenges. I'm fairly certain they'll have strategies to try and overcome them and they'll try and play as many games as they can, starting with the one obviously tomorrow and, and build up to competition. So by the time they get to competitions, I don't think there'll be any issue at all, but they might be a little bit ring rusty for three or four games um, to start with. Yeah. Um- Shay, in terms of preparations, um, are you do- doing things differently because of COVID that 
are things that have actually uh, that they're things that you'll use full time now because they're better than the way things were being done before. I don't know whether you've got sort of you know pre match protocols and things like that that you, you're now realizing actually that's a better way of doing it. So it's a it's a good learning to take from the COVID break. Yeah, um, probably probably some of the the ones for us is more around the replication of matches. So we we'd never thought about. Um, you know, playing like high end uh, boys teams before, and and really getting getting stuck into that because it brings the intensity and pace up, um, which is kind of replicating international hockey to a, to a point. And then um, obviously adding an extra extra numbers as well. We'd never never done that as well. Just to basically, you know, we're going we know what we're gonna get from Australia in the first five minutes tomorrow. It's gonna be an aggressive press. So we we put a fourth striker in um, for the opposition uh, when we played a game uh, on. Uh, Sunday and essentially every pass was under pressure so I think little bits and elements of that if we ever go into a bit of a hiatus again of six to eight weeks we'll we'll definitely look to replicate those because I think it just gives us a little bit of a head start on international hockey um, and then the other one as well is just um, sort of how to rebuild rebuild a squad um, from a COVID impact and people people stopping and, and some people have stopped because they haven't liked the probably what the last two and a half years has looked like in New Zealand um, and then just trying to do the bits in and around the team environment and doing things together and making sure that things are really really fun um, so we had a a really cool uh, presentation tonight where we had Helen Clark um, who debuted in 1991 as a goalkeeper you might remember um, so, so then um, uh, and she she presented all, the, all of our shirts and told her history and her story so we've been trying to really sort of build in our culture and, and really work in that aspect as well so if you're building the team as much as you can off the pitch well hopefully it will grow um, on as well so it's been a bit of a focus of ours because we've also been forced and had the time to do it through COVID. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Well, some teams have been in action and uh, over the past week we watched uh, England men and women and I think, Shay, um, you were you were watching that in, with lots of interest because obviously they're going to be um, opponents uh, at the forthcoming World Cup. Um, and Simon, you, you were there every single minute of every single blow of every single game. So, uh, first of all, I mean, we, we uh, just to remind the viewers, um, England women uh, won the first match and Germany women won the second match and it was exactly the same with the men. The men, Germany men lost the first and then bounced back and won the second. Uh, you've commented on those matches, Simon. What were your overall impressions, first of all, of the um, the attitude, the approach the, and the matches themselves? There's an open question that we could talk about for about three hours. Um, <laughs> in short, um, it, was, it was an interesting game, interesting games with some real clear differences across halves and quarters. There were some real momentum shifts um, in those matches. Teams started well. I mean, the first game for England men, I think if they played that game 10 times, they'd lose seven and they won one nil. It's one of those games where everything kind of goes right defensively. But when he was interviewed, Christopher Rue at the end of the game was interviewed and said, well, look, if you don't score, you're never going to win. And Germany got frustrated with that. Um, but... England played to their to their strengths on the day. Oli Payne was amazing in goal and saved several shots that you would anticipate would go in on a different day. Um, the, the women's game on day one was really interesting because it was a real swings and roundabouts game. Valentin, as I've already mentioned, was concerned that the, the German ladies were coming in off the back of a five or a six week break and they wouldn't gel. And I thought they would start slowly and then they would come back into it. And they just didn't they didn't mm. find their stride across the entire game pretty much and therefore they struggle with some fluidity and that allowed England to dominate some spaces and England had decided either of their own making or, or maybe they've watched some of the other hockey but when Germany ladies are pressed high they struggle a little bit with their distribution and, and Belgium proved that probably going back I lose track of time really but several months when they played in the pro league and England did the same to them when they did that. They, they asked them some real problems, some, asked them some real questions. Um, changed in, in day two, and the Germany men were very good. I know that England's believed, but Germany men were really good. Um, they very nearly undid themselves by blowing up massively in the last 20 minutes <laughs> with a horrendous set of disciplinary, I say horrendous, a bad set of disciplinary issues. I mean, they, they played 17 out of the last 20 minutes with with um, just nine outfield players. Um, for the women, it was better. England women started badly, conceded a couple of soft goals and, and never really got back into it, I felt. They played OK across a couple of quarters, but yeah, Germany sort of pretty much held firm. So interesting shifts to see how the teams were playing and some of the results were a little misleading, but it was great, it was great to watch some really exciting goals for, for the neutral spectator. Yeah. But technically, 
of the four games, probably two and a half technically weren't great. There was some really big turnover rates and coaches, I think, would be a bit frustrated. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was going to ask you about, sorry, I'll continue in a minute, Shay, but I was just going to ask, um, you, you made a comment about whether the coach was getting close to knowing their best combinations on the pitch. And there, seem, there still seems to be a lot of uncertainty, which for the men, that's actually not such a problem. But for the women, they've got a World Cup coming up soon. So, you know, at the end of that weekend, do you think the two women's coaches will be any closer to knowing what works? I found it inter- I continue to find it interesting that the, the rotations in the, the women's teams that we're seeing, even now getting this close to the World Cup and what we're, if I remember the graphic, we're now at like what, 58 days or something, whatever it is. I lose track of time. <laughs> It'll um, come across the bottom of the screen in a correct. minute. Correct. <laughs> it does. Yeah, there you go. Someone will correct me however many days it is. But I find it interesting there's so many rotations. I mean, you're talking when teams are playing at home, you're talking half a dozen rotations per game. And I, I appreciate that that countries still have leagues in play and, and playoffs and all sorts of things so you want to manage your players but it feels like and I've got team that's sitting in front of me just it's easy to talk about things but it feels like from a, from a German lady side if you focus on them from what I've watched in the last 12 months I reckon I can probably name 12 of the team that they'll take to the World Cup the interesting thing will be what happens in the bottom six and my opinion on that changes almost game by game because sometimes players are, having, uh, are in a rich reign of, reign of form, but then other players are falling away. And it's it's a bit the same with the Germany men's. Is like, Again, you could pick the, the first sort of 11 or 12, but when yeah. you then get into the bottom six, there's some real talent that they're going to have some really interesting questions about who plays in those bottom positions. I think for England, it's clearer cut. To me, I think that the teams are a bit more settled in, in my opinion, and, and I think it'll be pretty straightforward who gets selected across those sides moving forwards but yeah the the uncertainty and the amount of changes does uh I I find interesting to to watch that at the moment yeah I mean Shay what were your impressions you know did did you see some players there that you thought wow they're they're make they're going to make an impact yeah well probably the the, well the, for me the most spectacular player of the uh of game one was Flaschutz uh the, the German female player and the Turned turn the ball over at the circle edge on her defensive circle edge and went on a, a dainty sort of probably 90 meter run from down the sideline and internal internal run and then um uh, uh played the ball in for the for the cor- uh, one where they got the stroke um and I've, i think i've said this uh, on a previous time that i've been with you that she definitely reminds me of um uh, of stacy mickelson yeah. just in the way that she carries the ball and the way she runs with the ball and and the way she can break lines so i thought that was particularly good from from her um probably the the player i actually quite enjoyed watching a bit of was uh um born from england the pressing oh, yeah. and particularly in and around the the seven yard zone um so it's something we've been we've been looking for here in new zealand just you know the the late lead to get in front of your defender just to be a presence in that zone and and if you get good good quality ball in there with a good good deflection it's very very hard to to stop as a goalkeeper and she scored two goals from you know just little late leads and good deflection so i thought she was also also good but i'd have to agree um uh, that the the games were sort of yeah probably a little bit more open than i expected um a little bit more sort of goal shots circle penetrations than i expected as well um and and a little bit of turnover rate so it did seem like both teams were still figuring out their best combinations and their, their best ways of play um, but sort of yeah, they they did sort of ebb and flow, and and probably particularly in in game one, it kind of felt like the 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 puff was sucked out of England after the first five minutes when Germany scored in the first minute and then scored again. I think it was in the in the fourth minute. Yeah. Um, a bit of an interesting one, goal one Germany. What was your guys' take on that? Did you the, the goal one in the, in the first or the second game? In the, in the first game, the one that uh, appeared to go over the sideline. Sideline, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> It's one of those ones that if you, um, we get told this all the time from when we get the umpire feedback and we, when we're commentating on, on video umpire referrals and various things, you should, you can't go on player reaction, yeah. but, yeah. and I forget who the defender was, who who, um, who it was from, from an England perspective, who then just literally stood up and stood away from it because they thought it had gone off the sideline and then, mm-hmm. and then Germany carried on, Stafford was possibly carried on and just kept playing. And, you look at it and you go, it's such an immediate and honest reaction, not honest, but an immediate emotional reaction mm-hmm. to that situation. And you've seen something. And as a player, uh, we, all the cliches, play to the whistle, don't stop, all that sort of thing. Yeah. But occasionally you just go, and you, you, it's an instinctive stand up and stick yeah. your hand up. And, and therefore you look at it and you go, it feels like the player in contest saw it go over the sideline. And if you then look at 
I'm going to stick with the fact I think it was Charlotte Stafford who carried on playing. It was, Her yeah. immediate reaction wasn't, this is still on the pitch. There is a tiny momentary pause where she almost looks up to see if people are going to let her carry on. And so it felt yeah. like, and that's really important, because it felt like to me that it had gone over the sideline. However, there is nothing on camera that can prove it's gone over the sideline because the, the ball, what there looks like this clean turf, but actually the ball is oscillating up and down. So the turf, you can see it underneath the bounce. And consequently, the outcome in that situation can't be proven with our technical resources. So it felt like it should have been a sideline, but there's nothing to stay yeah. up uh, to, to prove it and therefore crack on. Yeah. I've, I've, I've never known this. As, uh, can I ask another question? Of course. Just as a viewer, like when we're watching um, the Pro League matches and say we're watching the TV footage, is what we is what the umpire sees is what we see, or are they seeing multiple different angles at the same time? I think that depends, doesn't it, Simon, on the on on where they are and what what the coverage is, because sometimes it's literally what we see, and sometimes they do have those extra angles, which True. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it also depends, Che, on so. There is, a, there is a minimum level of really technical, there's a minimum level of TV production required for the competition. And then other nations have the choice to go over the top of it. So if you look at, I'll use the Netherlands as an example, because they work with a particular company and you have more cameras and you have slow-mos and you have different angles. And therefore there's a lot more footage you can see. And the video yeah. umpire will be asking for as many angles as possible. But then that also depends on the relationship to the production truck and what can get on screen quickly enough. So in principle now, the idea is that whatever we see is what the video umpire is seeing because that leads to a transparency okay. and a clarity. If you go back probably well, pre-pandemic, so if we ignore that, but two or three years, then there was definitely technically an issue where we as the viewer and even as the commentator weren't seeing the same pictures, but we're trying to ensure from a TV production perspective that everybody sees exactly the same thing at all times because that then means there's almost an honesty about the process. So yeah, in principle... But- what we see should be what they see right now. Yeah. However, Shay, I've got to say, it's very, very um, easy to get things wrong, as Simon and uh, his many followers on Twitter will know, because uh, I think every single call that Simon tried to make was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, a different interpretation, not wrong. That's completely the wrong phrase. <laughs> Um, if we if we go back to the uh, back to back to the matches, I mean you, you're quite right, Cher. I mean the, those those Germany um, women, the, the youngsters who are coming through, so Jetta Fleschutz, uh, Stein Kurtz, Pauline Heinz, uh, Sonia Zimmermann as well is only 22. They, the the German squad do seem to be integrating their younger female players um, who played both the Junior World Cup and also if you remember they went and played in that Pro League um, series against India as well. Yeah, yeah. So there's a really there seems to be a very nice flow of players up through the German German ranks. I don't know if you agree with that yeah 100 percent. yeah they, they've um germany have traditionally done that where they've always um uh, really invested a lot of time into their their, their youth programs um as something I, I played a few years in germany myself and um even with the team that won beijing gold um and then again in, in 2012 gold i've always found that the german female and male players don't extend their careers as long as long as some other countries mm. so i've always found that they've had a really big um junior program and there has been a bit of um layover between between those groups i actually do think it is a, it is a good thing if you think about the the longevity of their program is that they've always got new players coming through whereas if um like say with us with the, the new zealand women's team We've had a like pretty difficult kind of couple of years where you, also the Olympics gets extended out where you've got a real concerted focus on 2018 World Cup, Com Games, and then 2021 Olympics. You kind of got a big core of that same group operating for three years. And we haven't really had a, a U21 program here as well. So it meant that we've kind of lost a bit of ground in terms of bringing in new players. Um, and we're kind of having to do that now because we're forced to do it. Um, so there's been a bit of a revision here in New Zealand that we do need to really invest time in our, in our under-21s program. Um, and then also for us with the senior women's, we're trying to send more players over to Europe for this coming season where that might be um, sort of up to 14, 15 players. So then we can have 15 players over there and then another um you know, 25 back here. So we're obviously extending our group out to 40 players. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of it and big believer in, in youth coming through as long as it's done in the right way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm just, I won't stick too much longer that we have to move to the men's games, but just speaking about some of those 
um, England younger players as well. I mean, you mentioned Darcy Bourne, who I thought at times looked very good. At other times, I thought she looked a bit a little bit like um, um, a, a colt who needed a little bit more training. I, Simon, I don't know what your thoughts are on some of the young England players coming through and how well they settled into the match and the match pace. Yeah, I mean, look, looking at looking at notes, I think England only had one player in the in the match day squad that was from the Junior World Cup. So. Um, and that was Mila Welsh, she played and got, yeah. uh, didn't actually play a goal, but um, she was the only player I think they brought in from that group. Um, I, I would agree with you about, about Darcy. Darcy's been obviously outstanding in the league, scored, a, I think, league's top goal scorer, scored a huge number of goals consecutively. Um, but I would agree, it, it looked at times a little lost. Mm. Um, but I think that reflects a little bit on... England overall it felt a little bit disjointed and there were moments when there were some great passages of play but it tended to be people almost who know each other or who've grown into the group a little bit I think there's some interchanges between even Hannah Martin and with Lily Owsley coming back and that's the first time she's played since the Olympics internationally but there was an there's an instinctive understanding and and Shay will know this far more than I will because he coaches at the level he coaches at but you have to be performing to perform well. You have to be performing almost at a subconscious level to make it quick enough. The minute there's any kind of hesitancy and conscious thought about what am I doing, the moment's gone. You can't you can't operate like that at an international level, in, in my opinion. Um, and therefore, it just looked like those immediate interchanges aren't there yet. Um, and consequently, players like Darcy, who at times is full of confidence. Then when they're then when you kind of looking around you and you're not quite sure what happens next, it does then look like you've almost got a group of people wandering off, not deliberately in any way maliciously, but deli- just wandering off and going, well, I'm not sure what happens next. And that's where it felt like the, the England team were at times. There was a lot of energy and enthusiasm, but there wasn't that the intricate fluidity and understanding that would have given them a greater degree of success. Yeah. Just ever so quickly, Holly Pern Webb's corners. Thanks for putting me on the spot with that one. And I, I will stand by what I said. I think they look, they look, that the England corners lacked invention. Mm. I think they were slow. slow. I think if you're, if you're getting a, a routine at international level where you have to self touch it before you slap it, the speed of the defenders now, you're giving them an extra second, which is what, two or three good strides. And consequently, because they, because a slap is flat pretty much by definition, that slingshot, sliding slap, whatever you want to call it. As a defender, you can just literally put your left hand down on the turf, put your stick in the way of it as a barrier, and it's, in my opinion, relatively easy to defend. And I just think it showed, it, it suggested a lack of invention in that moment. Now mm. you can argue that there's reasons for it and they don't want to show anything off at all, but I'm not sure it's something that I would persist with over a long period of time. No, I wondered if it was a tactic, you know, don't don't show a lot of other things, but because actually when Grace Balston stepped up and took one, we, we had, you know, there, there was a goal for England, so... Um, it doesn't create any fear. I mean, if you stand there going, I'm not going to show anything, then you just let people flick and say that you've got a decent routine that people have to worry about. By going to something like that, you, you are literally saying, I'm not even going to make you afraid. I'm not even going to suggest I've got something as a routine now. But then you meant to bluff and double bluff, so we can hypothesise. I just thought it showed a lack of invention. Yeah. <laughs> Let's move to the men's game. So we had, um, in, the first, uh, in the first match, as you say, England took a lead and defended it um, very, very, very well. And... and uh, you know, most matches you would have expected Germany to come back. But what, what did you think, and I'll come to you, or stick with you, Simon, on that one. Um, what, what was it that Germany weren't doing to turn that pressure into goals in that first game? A final pass in the circle wasn't as accurate as it needed to be. Um, they got some reasonable high possession, but England were able to keep defenders in a reasonable position and some decent alignment most of the time. And then when it did go wrong, you just had a goalkeeper that everything was hitting on the day. Um, you, and then when they won penalty corners, they just weren't quite firing. I mean, you've got someone like Gonzalo Payet is one of the best in the world still, and he's firing balls that weren't quite on the money, in my opinion, compared to where he's done it in the past. Mm. And therefore, Oli was Oli Payne was able. I visualised the save that he made between his feet that I just laughed at, which was brilliant. But you just stop it when you can. And yeah. <laughs> I've had some feedback from Mark Hickman that they actually train that kind of thing because of where flickers are now flicking around goalkeeper's feet and he got his heels together and then toe punted it away whilst falling backwards. And it's effective, even if not pretty. And on days like that, as an opponent, you just suddenly have to, sort of, at the end of it, you shrug your shoulders and go, it just wasn't going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So I, th I think it was the final pass in the circle that didn't give just that opportunity to just put it in, play round the goalkeeper, put it into an empty net, take a goalkeeper out who's playing fantastically well. So there wasn't just a little bit of composure was lacking. Yeah. And I mean, Ollie Payne did have a storming game. And uh, I think it's one of those situations, isn't it? When you when things are going right for you, it's almost like you gain momentum and things keep going right for you. And that's certainly how it seemed to be with the uh, with the England uh, England side. Now, you mentioned Gonzalo Payet. Um, and obviously in the, in the second match, he scored an absolute rocket of a goal. But um, Shay, you know the man. Um, he's he's going to be quite an asset for Germany, isn't he? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I played a couple of seasons with Gonzo at uh, at Hagesay in Holland um, before he actually moved to moved to moved to Germany. I almost wish he moved to New Zealand, and then he could be uh, um, playing with <laughs> us as well. I think most most countries probably enjoy uh, Gonzo flicking. Um, we'll never forget uh, him. I, he's he's probably the most calm person we've ever met. But um, he got angry at one one training session, and then uh, for him, he just flicked ten out of ten and just went. <laughs> corner 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 between the legs above the head corner corner it was absolutely something to behold like and the the keeper ended up um it was sam van der Ven, um ex-dutch keeper he ended up he just walked off he's like <laughs> i've had enough i'm out um so it's it's pretty cool um i know there'll be a lot of argentinians that would love to still have him playing for argentina um but for me it's just really cool that he's still playing international hockey um you know if his life is is in germany now and and that's where he wants to be with his with his partner floor um then and that's that's absolutely cool and, I, and i'm really stoked for him that he's back playing international hockey and then mm -hmm. also um uh, scoring goals and to score a goal in your first what, what was it Simon? 45 seconds or a minute minute 45 or so um, and his first game was was pretty cool, and I um, sent him a text message straight away just to congratulate him. So yeah, it's awesome that he's back. What what would he bring to the the team, like in in terms of his character? Is is he a big character on the pitch, and 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 will he, or or is he someone who just slots in and does his job? Yeah, he he he's always just slotted in and done his job. He's um I've always called him kind of the the quiet assassin, um, just your sort of unassuming kind of character on the pitch. Um, you know, parks himself either at left half or or left defence, and just has a really good outlet game. Very simple. Um, but he he kind of would fit into the German mold because he is very composed. You know, just yeah. get him on the ball, and he he just you know, does his job really, really well. And then um, the quiet assassin rocks up to penalty corner time and then you see the the true colours come out where he's got a bit of fire in his belly and you'll never see um, him ever do anything untoward or celebrate or anything until he's at the top of the circle and until he puts a ball in, um, in, a, in a really good time and then you'll see a, a big celebration from Gonzo and I've always loved uh, the way he does celebrate. It's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, there's another player on the Germany team who is hugely influential, but you would never call him quiet. Um, and uh, Chris Ruhr, I mean, he he can be mercurial and brilliant or he can be destructive. And and, and we saw all elements of that over the, over those two matches. Simon, what are your thoughts on Chris Ruhr? The screen hasn't frozen. I'm just trying to think through the words that you would <laughs> words that you would pick. Um, I would always want him on my team. Let's put it that way. He's 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 a brilliant player, isn't he? And, yeah. and galvanizes. Yeah, correct. And it's it's that frustration. I mean, I I watch some lots of different sports, and I, I have an issue only ever when players step over a line where their ability is compromised, either personally or collectively in a team, by a lack of almost self-discipline and you have to play to a line don't get me wrong if you're going to get the the passion and the commitment from anybody at the very very top level then you have to be prepared to go to the line and also flirt with the line but there are just times where where he and there's other players in the world but he over the over the weekend you so over the games you just saw the the line break and somebody once described it to me is that you have this if you imagine this red circle of passion, you then try and surround it with this blue crust of cool yeah. and composed. And the minute that breaks and the, if you imagine it as a molten lava and the lava starts to spill out, then actually the impact of the circle of passion then starts to dissipate because you lose that, that, that pressure. And there's moments, and we've seen Chris over the years do similar things and whatever language we use, I choose to use to describe it. Is, is negative because I think it is because if you get sent off for a period of time that is going to have an impact on the rest of your team but at the same time he is one of the very very best players in the world and I think he is much much better and more effective now than he was three or four years ago I think his control and his composure is better I think his skill set is broader and he's brought a lot into his game where he now looks for other people it's not all just about Chris Ruhr it's about what impact he can have. He plays slightly deeper. He looks to throw passes to get other people working. And 
I think that's brilliant. I just think he lost the plot for a short period of time. And the, I've only seen the, the, the physical nature of the one challenge that he made that he was 10 minute yellow for. I've only seen it once on screen in real time. And therefore, I'm, I'm not going to say it is better or worse than I saw in that moment. It didn't look very good, mm. but there's always a whole load of mitigating factors that you can't see unless you get into slow-mo. But I think there might be people looking back over that because it wasn't pretty. Yeah. Um, so it, it is what it is. And, and players, we've seen it over. Mm. Shay and I have seen it on pictures over, <laughs> over the years and every now and again. Something just breaks, not just from him. You see it from all sorts. And it can be players that you would never expect. It Suddenly something goes and yeah. it is what it is. But if you're trying to compete at that level, I kind of worry if it disappeared from his game because it would suggest he didn't care anymore. So I'm not going to overly criticise it. I think it can have a negative impact, but I wouldn't want to see him suddenly become this um, angelic choir boy because it's not who he is. <laughs> now, I mean, what it did mean, obviously, and it wasn't just him, as you said, it, it meant Germany played the last, I think it was 17 minutes of the match um, with less players. And, and at the time, England also took their goalkeeper off, which gave them another outfield advantage. Do you... Obviously, they didn't win. Obviously, England didn't get back on terms. But do you think they played that as well as they could have done? Or are there, is there a better way of doing what they did? I'll happily leave that to Shea. He's, he's the international coach. <laughs> he, right, yeah. So, so, so basically, Shea, you know, there, there we are. England have got this. Uh, have got a two-player on-field advantage, but they still didn't score the goals. Yeah. Um, or G Germany did it to us in Rio, for everyone that remembers that game, which probably, uh, yeah, I'll take to my grave. It does... Um, Whenever you take a keeper off, I, I would do the same thing. Like if uh, if we were down and and I'd use it as a as a bigger power play, it's obviously used in ice hockey all the time. Um, you you I, I would do the same thing, and then it's just about execution. So uh, probably the big thing would be whether um, you know has England talk through exactly how we're going to play with eleven, or if we've got an extra man, how we're going to play with eleven against nine um, or or ten, depending on the on the numbers that they've got and what are the areas of the field so sometimes I've always seen when a team goes up extra they pick, they go into pit pat mode where they just pat the ball around and then go oh yeah we're just going to give it to Simon in the corner and he's going to do something on and I'm not going to do it I'll give it to someone else and they just keep patting the ball around and they lose their intent um, that's probably the biggest thing I would say is that you've still got to maintain intent and not worry about um, losing the ball particularly when you've got it in the front 50 because you've got the extra men to defend um, but I always find that people were a little bit scared to then take passes on because then they're worried about turning the ball over because they've got no goalkeeper but if you turn the ball over trying to get the ball into the circle they've still got to go, come 75 meters to, to get down to your circle and I just think you've also got to flip the mentality if you don't have a keeper on the 23 becomes your circle edge that's where you've got to start really saying no no you can't even come into here instead of going we're going to defend the circle so that's kind of my little bit of two cents in a coaching aspect I would think. Brilliant I'm just looking at the time and I'm aware that we're running out of time so I'm going to ask you very quickly um, of the four coaches who would be happy do you think who and who would be perhaps thinking yeah I've still got quite a bit to do um, I'll come to you first Shay who, do, who, who which of those two women's coaches are going to be yeah, most happy do you think? Oh uh, yeah, um, tough. 50-50. <laughs> I think they, they well, any time you're playing an international game, um, you know, even even if you do win or lose, I'd, I'd rather be in, put it this way, I'd rather be in both both uh, coaches' positions, you know, with all the pro league matches that they had played over the last little while than sitting where we had been. Um, even if you did lose, it means you've got things to work on and then really implement into training. Um, so it's kind of, you know, while I'm really looking forward to what we're going to what we're gonna do tomorrow, um, you know, we're going to obviously chase the win and chase um, four test wins in a row. But if we do lose one, it's going to be learning for us as well. So I think win or lose, I think they're all tracking in, in a reasonable manner. Um, and I think on Simon's point as well, it's all about refining your squad and then getting that, um, that top 18 um, pulled in together for the World Cup. Simon, the men, who's the happier? I mean, Andre always looks happy, doesn't he? He, he does always look happy, to be fair. <laughs> Andre's one of those coaches that never looks unhappy. He's the other end of the spectrum um, <laughs> to, to a number of coaches who never look happy on the side of the pitch. But it, I, I'm, I think Andre would potentially be the happier because I think how Germany played over longer periods of time across the entire pitch, it showed better ability in each of the lines if I go defence and field and attack. I think they showed a greater degree of ability and understanding across all the lines on the turf. Um, but I think he'll have 
uh, more intense lows because of the nature of some of the disciplinary issues. So I think they're, they're on this roller coaster if they've got higher highs and lower lows, and England yeah. will be somewhere in the middle across those across those two games. Um, I think England might be a little bit concerned about how many good attacking opportunities they created, particularly when they went into that overload men up position. I mean, they played without a goalkeeper for the last 11 minutes and still couldn't break down that compact defence in front of them. And I totally agree with Shea and I talk about it all the time. I don't understand when a team goes to an extra player or two as they do. You've still got a back five. It's just I'm like, I, I don't I don't get why the, num- the numbers don't work. You have to continue to create pressure in that manner. So I think there's some stuff for... For Zach and then Revs when he comes in to work on um, across across both sides. So, yeah, I, I think Andre will be happier with his highs and lower with his lows, and Zach will be somewhere in the middle. There you go. <laughs> We're sort of, sort of sitting on the fence. Um, oh, Spain are in action against Argentina men and women. They're the next uh, Pro League matches coming up. Um, so we'll be chatting about those on the next show. Um, you two, thank you so much for your insight and wit and wisdom today. And uh, Shay, I hope you have a very successful uh, test series against Australia. And uh, we'll see you all again shortly. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Good luck, Jake. Yeah, cheers, Simon. Good, good to good chat to you. To you. Mm. Cheers.